Hello and welcome to episode 22 of the U3A radio podcast, where we showcase U3A members and events nationwide. I'm Nick Bailey, and I'll be guiding you through the next half an hour, where at the end of the program, we'll have a section on textiles with the unveiling of the U3A's 40th anniversary quilt and a chat with an expert on spinning wheels. Before that, though, have you always harbored a secret ambition to be a circus performer? If so, there's a group designed just for you. So we were given a, a tight wire. How high is that? I have visions it's... of you 25 feet up or something like that. <laughs> no, it's not that high. <laughs> but it's still a real thrill when you can walk across the tightrope. And we celebrate the 150th birthday of the composer Ray Fawn Williams and find out why his Lark Ascending is so popular. I can see why the Lark Ascending is, is quite popular because it conjures up an English scene. Uh, in the summer, laying back in a nice field and uh, hearing this bird twittering above them. Next month, on the 27th of October, the host of the long-running weekly BBC Radio 4 programme, The Life Scientific, Jim Al-Khalili, will be holding a seminar called The Arrow of Time. Peter Clift recently caught up with Jim and asked how he first became interested in science. Well, I think physics in particular, probably when I was about 13 or 14, and as always with these things, it's an inspirational teacher. I think I was always interested in science, but you know, at school I was good at lots of subjects. Uh, my mother was more into sort of arts, music and, 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 uh, and painting, but I just felt science was, you know, my, the way my brain is wired, I was good at maths. I realized physics was the subject I needed to study if I wanted to get answers to all the questions I was thinking about. And I really, from the age of 13, I've never looked back. Your field is quantum physics. In fact, you hold the distinguished chair in physics at Surrey University. Now, quantum physics is a subject, fair to say, beyond the comprehension of most of us. But through your books, TV, you managed to demystify science. Is public engagement an important part of your work? I, I use the word public engagement uh, carefully because I know you mm. hate the phrase dumbing down. In, indeed. That's important. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, the, the phrase dumbing down suggests that somehow the wider public are, are not as intelligent as me. And while it's flattering for people to say, oh, Jim, you must be so smart. You understand quantum physics. Uh, no, I've just spent my my life <laughs> thinking about it and studying it, like any any uh, specialism that someone might have. Yes, public engagement is important for me. I, I think uh, for the last 15, 20 years, I've pretty much split my my work half half and half between academic my academic role at the University of Surrey, teaching, doing research, doing all the things an academic does, publishing papers, getting research grants. But the other half is also sort of the outward looking broadcasting and writing and giving public talks. I've always said that if I discover something new about how the world works, why would I not want to shout it from the rooftops? So science communication is an extension of doing science, telling people about it. Uh, and that's always been as, for me, I've been as passionate about communicating my science as actually doing it myself. Difficult question, I guess, but which do you prefer, the scientific research or the public engagement? Yeah, and I've been asked this quite quite often. I think, you know, going back probably 10 years, I was doing a lot more TV work, for example, and I found it it was fun and going off in, in, in exotic locations, although, you know, I, I my programmes are for BBC Four, so, um, so the budgets weren't quite as big as, you know, an Attenborough or Brian Cox production, but I, I loved it and I, and I found it really sort of stimulating. But I think now if you were to ask me, you had to give something up, I would always go back to the day job which is as a research physicist, that's, that's really what, you know, when I'm in the middle of a, a, a research program, working with my postdocs and my students, that's what my brain is buzzing, thinking about trying to solve problems. Last thing I go, I think about when I, before I fall asleep, first thing I think about in the morning, if I'm heavily involved in some research problem, that's what really drives me the most. So in your latest book, The Joy of Science, you talk about confirmation bias. And in fact, you say, don't be afraid to change your mind. Now that's increasingly difficult as we get older. Mm. But should we always be prepared to change our mind? We should try. I mean, it's not human nature to, to you know, if, if you believe something to be right or true, then uh, it's really difficult to be persuaded otherwise. And it's the same in science. But the way we're trained in science, that's why this is one of the lessons of the scientific method, 
is that we do question our hypotheses, our theories, our experimental results, because we know that, you know, if they're wrong, they're wrong and the truth will out. So, so we are trained to always question what we think to be correct and true. So I see no reason why the rest of society couldn't also try and do a bit more of that. You know, while we want to, to have confirmed what we already believe, that's a natural, comfortable state of mind. Push yourself slightly out of that comfort zone and question why you believe what you believe. It may be you, that you're right, but it may be you, you're prepared then to see another perspective or, or point of view that, that changes your, your viewpoint on something. At the moment, we, we tend to hold everything as, as true, but who knows in 10, 100 years' time, that all might be turned on its head, mightn't it? Yeah, well, that's what we do in science. We're, we're In science, we're never... 100% certain about something. I think Voltaire said certainty is absurd. I'm pretty confident, you know, that the earth goes around the sun, not the sun around the earth. And if I jump off a building, gravity will pull me down to the ground. And I so therefore I won't do that. But you never know ideas in science. It may be there's that tiny, tiny chance that maybe we are wrong about something. And we have been wrong plenty of times in science. I mean, just, the, just in the past two years of the pandemic, scientists really thought that Washing your hands and singing happy birthday twice through will stop you catching COVID. Then we learn more, get more data coming in and realize actually it's airborne transmission is more important and you have to open windows. So having uncertainty and valuing uncertainty, I think is important. And, and I think, again, in everyday life, we shouldn't always be so certain that our view is right, because it may be that, you know, for whatever reason, we've gone up in the wrong, along the wrong path and we need to to be prepared to, to jump across and not, not have any shame in changing our minds. Your research, as we said, into quantum physics. Now, with so many problems in the world today, climate change, poverty, and everything else, how would you answer those who say we should be dealing with the immediate problems rather than spending money and time on research into quantum physics? It's an age-old question. Why, you know, why don't we why don't we concentrate on the here and now and not things that are just blue sky research? We don't have the luxury to certainly we have to make choices and we have to prioritize things but my answer is we do both you know um, learning about quantum physics is more than just climbing mount everest because it's there time and time again in science we've made discoveries which at the time seem to have no practical use to anyone and end up changing our world without quantum mechanics developed a century ago, you and I wouldn't be talking on this podcast because we wouldn't have had modern electronics. So you never know what these things lead to. But also it's part of the human condition that we're curious about the universe and our place in it. And it would be sad for us, for humanity, if we stopped thinking and being curious about the world. So would you say for people in U3A, that it's important then to keep on, in a sense, questioning, looking at that new things and, and what's happening around them. Absolutely. I mean, it's not only important for our own sort of mental health and well-being to keep our minds active, but there's there's no age limit on curiosity. You know, the, you know, we always say with scientists, the scientists are just the children who've never grown up, who've never stopped asking why. Very often, as 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 you you grow older, become wiser, you, maybe you have more time to contemplate and think about your place in the world that curiosity can be can be reignited you know through through the middle of our lives we're too busy bringing up children and working and earning a living and all the pressures and stresses of everyday life i think once once you get beyond that hump you you're you're back in that privileged position of being able to 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 think about the world and be curious again so absolutely how do you see things going in the next five years? I mean, for, as a scientist, what do you see as the next big puzzle? In terms of science, you know, the, of course, the big thrust now is how do we mitigate against the worst of, of climate change? Uh, and a lot of a lot of science from lots of different directions and disciplines are going to have to feed into this. But at the same time, technology is moving very, very fast. For me, one of the most um, important areas is artificial intelligence. You know, the whole idea of automation and robotics and machine learning is going to transform our lives as much as the Internet has over the last 30 years. It's difficult to look into the future and see what it would look like, but we need to have that conversation about how AI is going to be used, what we use it for, what are the ethical implications of it. Five years from now, 
uh, I'm not sure how different things will be. Maybe more of us will have electric cars. Maybe more of us will be using clever algorithms on our computers, d- making decisions for us. 10 years, 20 years from now, I think our world will be transformed beyond recognition, hopefully in a good way. Jim Al-Khalili. His seminar is on the 27th of October at three o'clock and is free online via Zoom. He'll be talking about the most profound aspects of existence, that we perceive time to flow from past to future, the so-called arrow of time. For more details, visit u3a.org.uk forward slash learning. Now, we know the U3A has many and varied groups, but perhaps none more unusual than the Circus Skills Group of Sandbatch in Cheshire. Founded in 2018, it's a novel way to keep fit, have fun, and produce a band of jugglers, hula hoopers, and tightrope walkers. It's run by a former teacher and trainer, Sharon Guinness, who had worked with circus groups in her career. But as she told Joanne Watson, it was the death of her husband that led Sharon to revisit those links and start the group. In that phase where I was really quite lost and grieving, Lots of friends came to my rescue and amongst them were the circus people that I'd known for a long time who just encouraged me to come out with them and do lots of of things at festivals and join in with the the work that they were doing uh, on community projects. And my interest in circus just took off at that point, I think. I'd always known about it, but I was suddenly seeing again from a different perspective just how how lovely it was. It was just so joyful to be part of. And I just thought this would be a really good thing to bring to the U3A. What actually do you do in a session? We do a small element of teaching in every session. I particularly enjoy hula hooping. So I've been learning hula hooping. So we will do something new and maybe a bit of something that we already know something about. So some more hooping tricks or We have quite a lot of peer teaching going on as well, because quite a few people have been with us since the beginning of the group, and they have their own skills now. One of the things that is really, really interesting when you come to it as an older learner is just reflecting on what it takes to learn something. So I do see people come into the circus group who learn to juggle in a very short space of time. And I am utterly and completely jealous because (laughs) I've been trying for a really long time and I've got just very basic juggling. I would join you there. But it's just fun trying. So we often have, you know, lots of laughter about the things that are not going so well (laughs) as well for us. And that reflection that actually to learn something and and do it really, really well, you do have to go away and practice. It's the only way to actually get really, really good at something. You mentioned juggling and hula hooping. What other skills have you been teaching them? We have a, a whole range of balance activities. So we were given a, a tight wire. How high is that? I have visions it's... of you 25 feet up or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that high, <laughs> but it's still a real thrill when you can walk across the tightrope. It is so; it's only about um, twenty centimeters. We have some wood beams that we use as a starting point for balancing because they're slightly wider, obviously, than the wire, so you can learn to walk across those. But we also do some acro balance, so that we are learning about core balance strength and building some strength as well because on top of that there would be roller bowler which is uh, balancing on top of a board which has got a a tube underneath so that it's like a being on a mini seesaw we read lots of articles that are looking at balance things like how long you can stand on one leg is a determiner of your health in uh, later life and I'm sure it must be to do with this posture and getting your spine in the right alignment being well balanced in your frame and as we get older and our muscles are getting weaker I guess it's so easy to let that slip a little bit unless you think about it and you're doing some activities that really make you think about standing in the right kind of posture holding yourself using the right muscles. I'm a non-juggler certainly never had any uh, success with my attempts so if, if you wanted to teach me to juggle balls, clubs. I mean, I can almost envision windows being broken as things get out of hand, stuff like that. Is there a 
a sort of starting point for something like that? Yes, there are lots of ways in. So right at the very, very beginning, we often used peacock feathers and just get people to balance things. Peacock feathers are nice and easy because if you look at the the beautiful centerpiece of the peacock feather at the top of the peacock feather and keep it on your hand or finger, you can feel that kind of balance and you're manipulating something with your hand that's very light. And then there are lots and lots of games that are cross-lateral games that can be done with just with hands. So holding your nose and your ear, clapping your hands and swapping over (laughs) and getting faster, just using one juggling ball, playing games like that where you... You need to get the right kind of arc for the juggling ball because the three ball cascade juggling that most people see is where the balls go into different corners. So your right hand throws up to the left corner and your left hand throws up to the right corner. And the two balls that you've got drop down into your hand and you you just have one in the air permanently while you keep that pattern going. So learning to make the right kind of arc with the the ball from one hand to another and then clapping in between, patting your knees, touching your head. When you get as far as throwing three balls, you can work with a partner. There are just lots and lots of lovely ways of getting to the point where your left and your right hand are working in a coordinated way. You've practiced the precision of the throws that you need to make and you've gained the rhythm before you have to inevitably you've just got to stand over a table or a bed and throw the balls and drop them (laughs) throw the balls and drop them until suddenly they start staying up in the air and you can you can just keep going when your members go home with all these skills there must be younger relatives who turn around and say look grand grand's a juggler or get the hoops out granddad you know do you get that sort of uh, reaction as well to some of your members yeah, people say that they this is a really good thing for playing with your grandchildren because amongst the activities that we do to build up skills, they're nice little games you can play with your grandchildren. So it's great to be able to hoop with them or, you know, to throw a Diablo or to use the flower sticks or to any of the kind of skills that we do. Getting that playfulness back and knowing a few little games seems to be something that brings a lot of delight to, to our members and to, to their families, yeah. Sharon Guinness. And maybe this is a case of do try this at home. Next month, on October the 12th, it will be the 150th anniversary of the composer Ray Fawn Williams, who yet again topped the Classic FM Hall of Fame this year with his Lark Ascending. He also came in at number three with his Fantasia on a theme of Thomas Tallis. Although Elgar has more entries in the top 300, He's never topped the charts, so why has Vaughan Williams proved to be so consistently popular? This is the question I'm going to put to the U3A subject advisor on classical music, Roy West. Roy, welcome. Thank you. So so what is the answer? It's a bit unfathomable, to say the least, really, because uh, I would have thought Elgar would have been at the top if it, you know, being an English composer. But um, I, I think his popularity does um, depend on his um, uh, being English. Uh, I think people of our age who listen to uh, Classic FM, I I reckon, are uh, really pleased to see the English composers hitting the charts. Uh, But um, Vaughan Williams is not a composer that I've really been familiar with. And uh, I've been doing a bit of... uh, listening to his symphonies and some of his orchestral music. I can see why The Lark Ascending is is quite popular because it conjures up an English scene uh, in the summer, laying back in a nice field and uh, hearing this bird twittering above them, which I think probably not too familiar now, is it? I I think uh, (laughs) there are fewer. Um, But um, that's what I can really say about it um i my music group that uh, that i had uh, last week um i asked them the, the question and see what they they came up with uh, and this is a, a few 
of the replies that I got. Quintessentially and typically English, the piece almost gives an impression of the bird hovering above you uh, whilst lazing in an English field. Good imagery and music. Represents hope in times of turmoil. I thought that was quite a good one, actually, because uh, we do live in turbulent times. Always have done, I suppose, but it, it is rather a tranquil piece of music. And I, I think it, uh, uh, that, that was a good point. An another view was that uh, the versions that you play on Classic FM are all by celebrity performers. And I think people like to hear all the great violinists playing. Uh, another view was a good introduction to classical music. Uh, I'm not quite sure how classical Vaughan Williams is, but uh, um, I thought that that's quite a good point. Do you think nostalgia has something to do with it? Well, I think so. Yes, yes. Is it? Um, does it give the sense of a of an England or Britain, if you like, that no longer exists? Yeah, uh, I think that that's that has some truth in it. Yes, and, and it's a tranquil piece, and and I think that point about it being uh, against turmoil. Uh, I think that's quite, uh, quite a good point, really. Did you get any negative comments? And, and the reason I ask this is that whenever this was played on Classic Air Baby, even though it got to number one, there were lots of people who would tweet and text saying, oh, not that blooming lark again. <laughs> <laughs> and it did have a kind of Marmite aspect to it. Mm. Did, you, did you get any negative comments? Or maybe you got negative comments yourself. I, I've, I've had a few negative comments about Vaughan Williams in the past, but I, I realised that he is a great composer. There's no doubt about that, with his longevity of life, uh, his background, because his parents didn't want him to be a, a musician, did they? they? They wanted him to go into the church because he's very well connected. He's connected to the Wedgwood family and also to Giles Darwin's family. So... Um, he is uh, really a quintessential Englishman, really. It wasn't just the lark ascending, see, it's the fantasia on the theme of Thomas Tallis. Nobody could give me a good answer as to why that, that is staying at number three. In, in fact, I, I got um, the feedback that it was, it was a bit boring towards the end. It starts off OK, because uh, there's this um, story about Sir Thomas Beecham, who was talking about Vaughan Williams, and he, he always said that it's a pity that he didn't write all his music on the theme of Thomas Tallis. <laughs> 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 Knowing him, he uh, was always ready with a pithy comment, wasn't he? <laughs> oh, indeed. But of course, Paul Williams, uh, I mean, th those are, uh, I wouldn't call them lollipops, to be honest. Uh, they're more than that. But he was a serious composer with some serious, serious symphonies, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. I've listened to them all now. If I can remember those, only just recently, <laughs> but th there's some really good music there, and um, it surprised me really because putting Vaughan Williams on Vaughan Williams on the shelf, not really listening to it uh, and coming on to it, you think, oh gosh, that is really good. But um, I, I thought in the old days, I thought his music was a bit untunedful. But um, having appraised all this this uh, symphonic work now, I, I think. Um, a lot of his orchestral music has certainly changed my opinion. He's certainly got something to say. Well, Roy West, thank you very much indeed for your insight on Vaughan Williams. So thank you very much for talking to me. Oh, thank you. Nice to talk to you, Nick. One of the main events for the U3A's 40th birthday celebrations was the unveiling of a quilt created from the winning 40 blocks submitted from U3A's across the UK, reflecting the skills, experience and contribution of U3A members. Following its unveiling at the Whitworth Gallery in Manchester, it's now moved further south, where our quilting correspondent Peter Cliff takes up the story from a very noisy hall. Today I'm out in West Oxfordshire, in Whitney in West Oxfordshire, in fact in the Whitney Blanket Hall, where the U3A and 40th anniversary quilt will be on display for a whole year. Here today are many people from U3A, and several of the people who have been involved in the actual making of the quilt. I'm Penny Harper. Now you're not from Whitney, 
No. You're from Gloucester. Gloucester, Gloucester right? Gloucester City. Yes. Gloucester City, and you do have one of the squares. I do indeed. Which one is yours? Mine is the one in the circle up there with the international city. That shows my attendance and interest in circle dancing. And the ethos of circle dancing is peace and love. And what are your views of the quilt generally? I'm absolutely blown away by it. Mm. And also the person who's put it together has done it so skillfully. Thank you very much. I moved over to talk to Anne, Anne Francis from Whitney. You also are the quilters. I am, yes. I uh, designed the Scrabble board. All right. <laughs> Uh, it just shows the, the three words that we always refer to. Live, laugh and learn. <laughs> Sorry. What, what, what do you think of the, the quilt generally? No, oh, said... generally perfect. Mm. Absolutely stunning. Well, what did you think of it? I, I, I was amazed, actually. Absolutely amazed. Yeah, yeah, I, it's a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. It's, quite... it's colourful too, isn't yes, it? Yes, very, very, very colourful. Colour. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, no U3A event is complete without a cake. As we're all enjoying our U3A cake, I've moved over to interrupt Jane Clark from Whitney from eating her cake. Jane, what is it like to see the finished quilt? Oh, it's lovely. We're really pleased with it. It couldn't be better, I don't think. It's really magnificent there. So, yes. Yeah. And are you surprised at the, the finished article of this? Anne and I went up to Manchester when it was originally unveiled, so we had already seen it. Um, up close, so right. we knew what it was like, but we were very, very impressed by it when we saw it first in Manchester. Okay, thank you very much. I'll let you continue with your cake. Thank you. Well, it's very busy here, and I've managed to curtail Michaela Moody, who's the vice chair of, of U3A. Michaela, what's it like to see the quilt actually up on display? It was just mind blowing because um, I knew it was going to be fantastic but nothing prepared me for the vibrancy of the colours. And it's going to be in the Whitney Blanket Hall, as we've said, in Whitney, West Oxfordshire, for, for about a year. Yes. Um, what are the plans after that? Do we have any plans for it? I have got a plan, which is to go for the Villa Victoria and Albert. Well, we certainly hope you do. Because it is a fantastic quote, and I urge anybody to come and have a look. Oh, yes. Kayla Moody, thank you very much. I'll let you go back to the cake. Thanks, Peter. And I hope you save some cake for the rest of the team. The U3A anniversary quilt is currently on show at the Whitney Blanket Hall for a year. And if you'd like to have a sneak preview, you can see a picture of it at u3a.org.uk. We stay with textiles. And if you ever want to know about spinning wheels, then Val Bryant from U3A Nutsford and manager of the local Heritage Centre, is your go-to person. In 2005, she received a Passold grant to do research into these now collector's items, which took her to many National Trust properties around the UK. She's been speaking to Val Dawson. It was wonderful to go in all these properties and see all these wheels, because a lot of people haven't realised what kind of wheel they got. Some of them have got really good wheels, and Snow Hill... Manor in the Cotswolds, and the Cotswolds yeah. has the biggest collection. They've got 16 spinning wheels, wow. which was wonderful. And each time we left and I did the report, I then sent each house a report. So within their archives, they have a report mm. on all the spinning wheels they have. And would the public have access to any of these reports? Or is it just a, a National Trust? Yes, if they, uh, they ask. Mm. Um, they're there, mm. yes. So presumably, you had you visited many of these National Trust properties anyway yourself or not? Just one or two. Mm. Snows Hill I'd visited before, mm. but not many. No, mm. not many. Um, when you get right up to Newcastle and all round there, I'd mm. never been that mm. far. So there was I, having a good time looking at National <laughs> Trust properties and their wheels. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Um, so that, that's really... The past old uh, adventure I had, which was absolutely wonderful, because it just opened floodgates for me after that, which I would have never dreamt would have happened, um, because I found out there was a spinning wheel in Frogmore House that belonged to Queen Victoria. So you write to the um, uh, Windsor Castle. Um, and the archives, and oh. they said, oh yes, and because with what I'd done with the Passold helped me, and they said, yes, we'll arrange for you to come and um, measure it up and take photographs, 
which I did. Marvellous. Isn't that where William and Catherine are ending up, the yeah. family? In but the I house? got permission by Her Majesty wow. <laughs> to go and do this because I uh, signed a, a piece of paper that I wouldn't use these photographs, only for my own purpose mm. of research. And, of course, with that... Um, one of the people in the National Trust who is the furniture um, person said, oh, there's, um, you know, Isle of Man. And he got me over to the Isle of Man and the next thing I was there doing all the Isle of Man spinning wheels and recording those. How many were they then? Forty. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Then I went over to Ulster and the Folk Museum and there was about 80 or more over there. These were working wheels, were These they? were mm. wheels that were in their collection, in mm. their store. Right. And it was fascinating, wow. you know. Some of them you were blowing off cobwebs and things, but never mind, <laughs> it was interesting. And it was through that um, meeting that um, the next thing I was um, within the v in Blythe House. Amazing. Doing mm. all the spinning wheels within the v Museum. Mm. And I did one wheel, which was a beautiful wheel, it was on show. And I said, that's not quite correctly um, displayed. And they just turned around and said, well, you're the spinning wheel lady. We know nothing. And I thought, <laughs> gosh, this is me, you know, talking to the V&A. Val Bryant, who's now even turned her loft into a museum where she currently has 15 spinning wheels. And that's where the spinning has to stop as we've come to the end of the podcast. Don't forget, if you'd like to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. We're always after personal interest stories. So if you or a fellow member has done something unusual, please get in touch via communications at u3a.org.uk. My thanks to Peter Clift, Joanne Watson and Val Dawson for the interviews and to Ella Watts for producing the podcast. Until next time, this is Nick Bailey saying goodbye.